Good morning, everyone. Good morning. How are we today? Good. Look at this full house. Oh, I love this time of year. Yes. Ah. Well, if you don't know me, hello, my name is Heather. I'm the music director here at the Sonoran Desert Center for Spiritual Living. Welcome to Sunday morning. Let's stand and let's sing this song on the yellow page. I love this one. Do you? It's called an attitude of gratitude. I got an attitude of gratitude. I'm grateful for this day. For peace of mind and wellness, I'm blessed in every way. For spirit works within me, and so it lives in you. There's so much to be thankful for, it's so easy to do. I've got an attitude of gratitude, I'm grateful for this place. For joyfulness belonging in every happy face. The spirit of abundance surrounds our every deed. And when got an attitude of gratitude, I pass it on to you. With kindness and compassion, our light comes shining through. Together we can share the love, we've got a place to start. An attitude of gratitude, we're sharing from the heart. We're sharing from the heart. Good morning, everyone. I haven't been up here in a while. I'm sure you appreciated it, but sorry, I'm back. Um, it is wonderful to be back up here and to see so many people filling the chairs. It's wonderful. Um, so good morning, my name is David Burke. I am, <laughs> hello, <laughs> I'm your trustee on duty today. On behalf of Reverend Donna Maurer, the board of trustees, and our wonderful practitioners, I am privileged to welcome you to the Sonoran Desert Center for Spiritual Living. Whoever you are and wherever you are on your spiritual path, you are truly welcome here. Here you will be validated, supported, and encouraged to be all that you were meant to be. Our vision statement is love in action every day in every way. We express this love by learning and living the principles of the science of mind. On the back of your programs, you will find our declaration of principles. Please join me now in reading them. I believe there is an infinite intelligence operating throughout the universe. I believe this intelligent power is only good. I believe this intelligence expresses as me. I believe through my conscious use of this power, I create my life as happy, healthy, and complete. And so it is. Do we have any first timers today? I haven't yeah. been here for a while. Okay. <laughs> I do recognize some of you. I, I live in Bend, Oregon, but I'm here for the winter. All right. Welcome back. Please stay after and have some refreshments and get to know us a little better. Um, I would like to thank all the people that made this Sunday celebration special. It's all of you people filling almost every chair here. So thank you very much for that. And all the people behind the scenes that do so much. Uh, people in the kitchen and uh, Don and Bruce with setting things up and 
just so many people. Uh, we really appreciate it, so thank you. Please direct your attention to the announcements that are in your bulletin. And if you're watching online, please visit cslaz.org for our announcements and events calendar. God in me beholds the God in you. It is all for our greatest and highest good. The God in me beholds the God in you. And you and I are one. Namaste. The God in me beholds the God in you. It is all for our greatest and highest good. The God in me beholds the God in you. And you and I are one. Namaste. Namaste. Hmm. Namaste. Good morning, my name is John Lopez and I am your practitioner today. The practitioners are the healing arm of our center. And so if there's anything going on with you that you would like treatment for, please fill out a prayer card on our table over there, put it in our prayer box and our practitioner team will do prayer and treatment for you all this coming week. Or you can come see me after service and I will do a one minute miracle for you. So I light our service candle, knowing that it represents the divine God light within each and every one of us. So join me in our opening invocation. And let's know together that we are one, that God is everywhere equally present, filling all space, filling this sanctuary, manifesting, expressing as today's service, which is already perfect, whole, and complete. And together we say, and so it is. So my reading this morning is by Jim Palmer, whom I had never heard of before, but I came across him online. Jim Palmer is the founder of the Center for Non-Religious Spirituality. Jim is a certified spiritual director and a member of Spiritual Directors International. He is a chaplain with the American Humanist Association. His background includes a Master's of Divinity from Trinity Seminary in Chicago. He's a professor of comparative religion, philosophy of religion and ethics. He's a trained religious trauma and spiritual abuse counselor. Jim is a published author, 
speaker, podcaster, and retreat leader. So this was a quote from one of his books. Christians don't believe their own Bible. <laughs> Which says, God is love. God is love. Which means, love is God. So think of it as God as love. God as love is not tied to the performance-based system that religion is fond of teaching. God as love is not a reaction to your actions or beliefs. God as love is not a spigot that turns off and on based on the accuracy of your theology. How religious you are or how far you've progressed on your journey. The fact that God as love means that this love is unconditional because it is an innate quality of what we refer to as God, not a reaction to your performance. It's not that God does loving things, God is love. You're never going to show up in a moment when this is not so. Love is the underlying, unchanging, primordial, and fundamental essence of all things. You are born out of love, born into love and born as love. The Bible says God is love as a way of expressing that love is the highest truth and ultimate reality. This love does not fluctuate. It cannot be earned or lost. It is never threatened. This love is available to all people, all the time, everywhere. The greatest discovery of life is not only that you are loved, but that love is what you are. To be born in the image of God is to know oneself as love. That's from his book, Notes from Over the Edge. <laughs> Namaste. So I take our candle and we'll be holding the high watch for you. Peace within.
And our topic today is fully present, fully engaged. Um, the student spoke with his master. Where shall I look for enlightenment? Here. When will it happen? It's happening right now. Then why don't I experience it? Because you do not look. What should I look for? Nothing. Just look. At what? Anything your eyes alight upon. Must I look in a special way? No. The ordinary way will do. <clears throat> but don't I always look the ordinary way? No. Why not? Because to look, you must be here. You are mostly somewhere else. <laughs> and isn't that true about us? I mean, we don't hear that still small voice. We don't see God at play in our lives because we too are somewhere else. To experience the presence of God, to feel the gratitude that accompanies that experience, we have to be present. We have to be in the moment, not regretting things from the past or bowling them over and not worrying about the future. Christina Baldwin in Seven Whispers, a spiritual practice for times like these, says that we should practice moving at the pace of guidance. And I've spoken about this before, but I love it. She writes, in a world of speed and distraction, the pace of guidance invites us to combine the practices of measured movement and listening. Speed is some guy running through the airport shouting into a cell phone. Pace is going around the block with a three-year-old and noticing everything that child is noticing. So our experience with the child is what being fully present and fully engaged is all about. To see through his eyes, to experience things for the first time, to put aside any agenda and let the little child lead us. Christina goes on to say we must hang on to our humanity. It is why we're in the world. We are a one-of-a-kind species, and we are at a crucial turning point in our evolution the pace of guidance, like peace of mind, begins internally in me. Even though all my conditioning teaches me to accommodate speed, I am responsible for the pace I bring to the moment, just as I am responsible for the peace I bring to the moment. So to me, moving at the pace of guidance is really and truly a spiritual practice. When our movements are measured, they're slower. And I believe that it's through listening, both inwardly through meditation and spiritual contemplation, and outwardly as we truly listen to all that is going around us, that we are able to slow our pace and move in tune with something deeper than that which we find in the world of speed. Speed cancels out guidance. When we move in speed, we are out of touch with spirit. And when we're out of touch with spirit, we are out of touch with the rhythm, the natural flow of life. You know, how many times have we run about like a banshee hen because we put ourselves under an impossible deadline? And when we try to speed up the process, the more obstacles we encounter that put us even more behind. I mean, we've all been there, done that. Speed cancels out thoughtfulness. Our decisions made in haste are often not, not those that we would have made had we slowed down and thought more carefully. When we move at pace, we have time to question and time to listen for answers before moving on. When we move at pace, we automatically become fully present. And when we are fully present, we are able then to be fully engaged. I think you and I are so blessed to have found this teaching because it's about learning to be fully present and fully engaged. It's about seeing God in each experience. It's about our own attitude of gratitude that we carry through the day. Dr. Michael Beckwith in his book, Spiritual Liberation, Fulfilling Your Soul's Potential, uses the term evolved people. 
And he says, these are lives, these are people whose lives are full of joy, enthusiasm, curiosity. And he defines seven practices of evolved people. And as I read them, I thought, this is what it means to be fully engaged. So I changed his words a bit using fully engaged instead of evolved. And I've talked about these before, but I wanted to represent them because they're, they're really so appropriate for today and something that we can take home and realize that in this Thanksgiving time, this is the way you and I are fully engaged. First one, fully engaged people give thanks for what most people ordinarily take for granted. Most people give thanks or say thank you when something wonderful happens. We all say thank you when we're given a gift or someone does something nice for us. But fully in engaged people go deeper and give thanks for the things which often go unnoticed. I know every time that Rosie and I talk on the phone, we always have something to be grateful for, for, you know, regardless of the aches and the pains and all the situations that may be going on. There is always something to be grateful for. A fully, as fully engaged people, we know that gratitude is an expression of humility, a recognition, a recognition that even before we ask, we have already received so much good. Our founder, Dr. Ernest Holmes, says gratitude is not only a virtue, but it is also part of a practical philosophy of daily life. There's no wiser way of living than to remember every morning what life has given us and to lift up our thought and thankfulness for every bounty we possess. From a practical standpoint, we know that what we focus on becomes fact in our lives. There is a perfect outworking from thought to thing. So those dominant thoughts in our life will produce those things. Having an attitude of gratitude reprograms our thought processes so that we are focused on that which is good and beautiful. And because there is a law of mind in action, that is what we will experience. Fully engaged people give without agenda. Dr. Michael says that fully engaged people have moved from a mindset of getting something from the world to letting something within us be freely given. We live in an opulent universe that is sourced from unconditional love. That is the truth of who we are. And we are the instruments through which this unconditional love and this opulence can manifest on this planet. Again, Ernest Holmes says, real giving is the art of transmitting ourselves to others and to the conditions and situations that surround us. This kind of giving is not something for special occasions only, for it should become a habit growing out of our desire to live life to the fullest. Only that which becomes an inward habit of thought can spontaneously flow from the heart and transmit itself to everything we touch. Dr. Holmes says, just as life belongs to the one who lives it, so the fuller life belongs only to the one who scatters every good he has. It is by giving of oneself to every person, every project, and every association with zest, love, and friendliness that one sees the larger possibility in all things, beauty instead of ugliness, love instead of hate, the divine hidden within the human. So if you and I, as we wake up each morning, ask ourselves, how, can I, how and where can I give today? Or where may I be of service today? We're, we're going to find answers that allow our hearts to overflow. And we will be scattering all the good we have. So others will be gladdened by our presence. And we have that good returned back to us. Number three, fully engaged people race to see who can forgive first. To carry a grudge, a resentment, or... Um, Anything like that is harmful only to the person who carries the burden. It doesn't affect the other person at all. You know, I've, said, I've said so many times, it's like drinking poison and waiting for the other person to fall over. You know, it's just not going to happen. And the only person who's going to die is us. You know? so, so when we are resistant to forgiveness, we carry a consciousness of lack because we are saying, in essence, that somebody owes us something. And because everything is energy, 
we know that that thought form of lack will outpicture in our experience. And that's why it's important to forgive as quickly as possible. The power of forgiveness is liberating because it removes obstructions to the flow of good in our lives. It allows us to let go of our need to be right and to focus on what is really important. Ernest Holmes says, whatever the mistakes of yesterday may have been, today is a new creation. Turning from the errors of the past and no longer carrying with us the sorrows and mistakes of yesterday, today we may enter into a new experience. But it is only when we forgive everyone that we may feel certain that the weight of condemnation is lifted from our own consciousness. We should refuse to carry the negations of yesterday into the positive atmosphere of today, for today the world is made new in our experience. So forgiveness is really about setting our own selves free. It's not about the other person. And forgiving somebody doesn't need, mean that we stay where we are. An abused wife can forgive her husband, but she doesn't need to stay in an abusive relationship because forgiveness is never about being a doormat. Number four, fully engaged people experience life as a celebration rather than a problem to be solved. Um, and I love this one. Dr. Beck Beckwith says, fully engaged people understand there's a celebration going on throughout this great universe and that a cosmic celebration can be localized within you when you realize that life is not a problem to be solved, but a magnificent mystery to be lived. We cannot go through life without challenges. We know that. But we have a choice to see those challenges as problems or as opportunities for our growth. If you and I are stuck in any kind of a problem, we give it energy and it becomes a gigantic dragon that we think we have to fight. If we, in the quiet of our own heart, realize that we are divine wisdom incarnate in us, then there is that whisper that tells us that we will be all right, even in the midst of something we deem huge. And if we can ask to be shown the gift within the challenge, we can find the gift. You know, we've all heard this story, I've told it a couple of times, or maybe more than a couple, about, about the butterfly struggling to make its way out of a cocoon. A man saw it and wanting to help gently cut back the cocoon to ease the butterfly's struggle. The butterfly emerged, but its wings were withered. It moved about for a short time and then died. The man realized that the butterfly's struggle was necessary because in those forceful efforts to become free of the cocoon, the butterfly's wings were strengthened and made whole. And without that exertion, the butterfly could not survive. You and I are going to face challenges. And if we see life as a celebration, those challenges will make us stronger. We will have strong wings that will help us fly. And number five, fully engaged people talk to themselves and not to the world. <laughs> um, <laughs> you like that, it's fun. <laughs> Michael Beckwith says that fully engaged people trust their inner guidance system to direct them in the areas in which they have yet to grow, while knowing that they already are a uniquely beautiful expression of the infinite. Mm -hmm. So you and I have within us the entire wisdom of spirit. There is that within us that knows what to do, when to do it, and how to do it, and we cannot tap that vast resource if we are seeking guidance from outside of ourselves. And I think we can ask for guidance from people that we trust, people that have more experience than we do, but that's not the final step. And the final step is going within and saying, okay, I've gathered all this information, but what do I believe about that? What is my inner voice telling me about that? And take our step from that place. As Ernest Holmes says, listen to your own voice. It will speak in terms that are unmistakable. Trust in your own self more than in all else. All great men have learned to do this. Every person 
within his own soul is in direct communication with the infinite understanding. When we depend on other people, we are simply taking their light and trying to light our path with it. When we depend on ourselves, we are depending on that inner voice that is God speaking in and through us. Six fully engaged people choose happiness over drama. Don't we all know or have in our family a, a drama king or queen? <laughs> Someone who is always immersed in one drama after another, and it feels like they depend upon these dramas, one crisis after another, in order to feel alive or get the attention they feel they need. But actually, living in drama is exhausting. It zaps our life force, our enthusiasm, our joy. It seems we are waiting for the next shoe to drop. And if that's what we're waiting for, guess what? <laughs> it drops. Again, if we go back to principle, we realize that we create our experience through our thoughts and beliefs. If our thoughts and beliefs are centered on fear, distrust, worry, then that will be our experience. That will be our drama. Michael Beckwith says, happiness is our true nature. We begin to exude happiness when we reach within to its source through the practice of meditation. In meditation, we drink copiously from the well of joy and cultivate a yes point of view. Then when challenges arise, we meet them with confidence in our ability to respond skillfully, maintaining an inner happiness that cannot be hijacked by drama. And number seven, fully engaged people understand the value of downtime. Most of us, <laughs> I, hear some, I hear some movement here. <laughs> Most of us have grown up with the idea that we need to be productive, we need to be constantly doing. And as children, we've been, we've been told, stop daydreaming and, and get busy and do something. You know? so, so we learned probably, many of us learned at a very young age that simply being was not productive. And today we know better. Lao Tzu in the Tao Te Ching says, the way to do is to be. And what I know from experience, if I spend time in meditation or simply daydreaming, if I set some intentions in that quiet time, then I am most productive when I move out into the doing part of the day. And we need to honor our need for quiet time. An empty cup serves no one, especially not ourselves. Our spiritual cup is filled when we take time to meditate, to walk in nature, to commune with that inner presence that sustains our life and our joy. Michael Beckwith says, if we are planting a tree, we bury its seed in the soil so that it can germinate where it is dark, quiet, solitary. The seed is nour nourished by the nutrients in the soil. This time underground is vital to the growth of roots and prepares the tree to experience life above ground with its rain, winds, and frost. Our spiritual root system requires the nutrients of the infinite in order to be fully present for our life's experiences and to meet them with receptivity, clarity, intuition, and confidence. When we set aside downtime to meditate, pray, contemplate, introspect, and study, we find that joy, peace, love, generosity of heart, compassion, and giving are perennially in season. As we feel ongoing gratitude for all the blessings in our lives, as we give without agenda, serving others with a grateful heart, as we come to each experience with compassionate forgiveness, we allow our light to shine. As we see life as a celebration, a magnificent mystery rather than a problem to be solved, we become channels for joy. As we turn to that infinite wisdom that resides within us, we are guided by grace in all that we do. When we choose happiness and joy over drama, we say yes to all that life has to offer. And finally, as we take time to simply be allowing the tranquility of our soul to nourish us from the inside out, we find that we are fully present 
and fully engaged in everything that we do. Thank you. Namaste. time for our offering. We have time to put our law of divine circulation in process. Um, so won't you join me in our offering affirmation. My gift goes forth to heal, prosper, and bless all that it touches. It is evidence of my conviction that God is the source and substance of my supply. I share generously of my good, knowing that it returns to me multiplied abundantly, and so it is. Thank you for everything. Thank you for everything. Thank you for everything. Thank you for everything. Thank you for. Thank you for your generosity, your love um, that allows us to be a beneficial presence in this community and allows us to keep our doors open and our center flourishing. So let's take a moment to close this portion out in prayer and please join us for refreshments and a chance to get to, to know each other a little deeper. I know that there is one divine intelligence 
And I know that his attributes are love, truth, beauty, harmony, peace, abundance. And I know that that is our natural state, that we are born with those attributes. And so I speak my word where there is any area that those attributes are not being expressed to know that the divine power and presence of God is right there. And as we turn to that, we do experience a healing, a recovering, a wholeness. I give thanks for this spiritual home and family and to know that we have a place to go to share our smiles and our frowns and our joys and our sorrows and know that we are accepted exactly as we are because each of us knows that we are part of that divine connection. So I just simply give thanks for the opportunity to be here today, for the opportunity to speak my words with love and to know simply that all is good and very good as we say together, and so it is. And may we stand and sing, stand. So let there be peace, I am a stand for peace. Let there be love, I am a stand for love. Let there be joy, I am a stand for joy. We are living a new world now. So let there be peace, 